afternoon, folks. Good afternoon, folks. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ann, for that introduction. I'm really happy to be uh, to be here. It's my first time in Bordeaux. When my wife heard the conference was going to be here, she said, "We're going." Out of out of what you think. So we're here, um, and I want to thank the conference organizers, and especially Christina, uh, who invited me uh, when we had dinner last fall, I guess it was. So thank you very much. I'm happy to be a part of this panel, um, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your thoughts uh, about my presentation and those of my uh, fellow panelists. Um, the 20 minute mark is fine with me. I heard a Southern preacher say one time, no souls are saved after 20 minutes. So <laughs> if I can't reach you in that time, then it wasn't worth my trip, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to have at it now. I'd like to talk today about the history of the ICA and its significant flaws and shortcomings. Indigenous nations continue to define the parameters and responsibilities of their citizenry, some more effectively than others. Yet the extension of U.S. citizenship over individual natives remains awkward and ill-fitting as outside forces seek to both assimilate and disenfranchise us depending on the political aims of those forces. One of the fundamental distinctions between native peoples and other racial and ethnic groups in the United States is their relationship with the federal government. From the beginning, this relationship was a political one steeped in diplomacy, treaties, and a variable form of trust. It was, in fact, a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. With the passage of time, while these relations have continued, the question of citizenship remains problematic. At the heart of these charged political relations is the principle of consent. Without meaningful formal consent, decisions such as the extension of citizenship are constitutionally problematic. Even though there are arguable disadvantages, the ambiguities of tribal citizenship, native, federal, and state, continue to plague indigenous peoples living within the boundaries of what is now the United States, as well as the insular territories. In the late 18th century, from the newly established federal government's perspective, Native nations were viewed as relatively small, largely uncivilized polities, logically dealt with, however, as separate nations. This is evident in the provisions of many of the key documents of early U.S. political history, the Declaration of Independence, the Federalist Papers, the Northwest Ordinance, the U.S. Constitution, of course, and the various Trade and Intercourse Acts. The trio of Supreme Court decisions, better known as the Marshall Trilogy, were also critical in the construction of the tenuous foundation upon, upon which relations largely remain based. Each of these documents acknowledged that Native peoples belonged to their own nations and thus clearly were not citizens of the United States. Building upon these tenets, the interpretation of the Commerce Clause, the practice of treaty making, and emphasis on the geographic, political, and cultural distinctiveness of Native nations further events that we were defined and engaged by the federal government as necessary political and economic allies. At that time, at that point in time, the property white men who had created and designed the United States did not view indigenous peoples as likely to abandon their identities in favor of U.S. citizenship. Yet even as these nascent nation-to-nation -nation relations were unfolding, elements in Congress were already acting to extend American citizenship to individuals and segments uh, to certain indigenous communities. While ideas and proposals varied, there were common themes. Individuals or portions of nations were required to abandon their tribal nation, relinquish tribal property, adopt the habits and customs of white Americans, and were required to learn to read and speak English. The paths to this goal were muddled and applied in a rather haphazard fashion. Depending on the nation, federal interests, local bureaucracies, and the power and skills of lawmakers behind each of the various schemes. Over time, the conflicts and confusion worsened to such a degree that in 1851, an exasperated U.S. Attorney General, Hugh Swinton Legarth, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, Celine Legarth, would declare that, quote, there is nothing in the whole compass of our laws so anomalous, so hard to bring within any precise definition or any logical and scientific arrangement of principles as the relation in which the Indians stand toward this government and those of the state. While a great deal has changed over the last 170 years, the Garth's observations still hold sway with regard to the status of the current 574 
federally recognized Native nations within the boundaries of the U.S., Hawaiian Natives, and of course, the peoples of the insular territories. In 1851, very few Native Americans were U.S. citizens, but in the decades following his observations, the federal government pursued an aggressive policy of assimilation that was initially voluntary, but later harshly coercive. Those officials, those official processes served to further complicate the legal and political status of Native individuals. In the wake of the U.S. Civil War, amendments to the Constitution wrought profound social societal changes. The 14th Amendment ratified in 1868 for the first time codified that the federal government considered the role and status of Native nations and their citizens in relation to the U.S. The first clause of the 14th Amendment declares all persons born or naturalized in the U.S and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the U.S. and the state wherein they reside. This plain language could logically be read to mean that natives, virtually all of whom are born in the U.S., were of course now citizens of the U.S. However, this plain language was not plain enough, as the Senate Judiciary Committee was subsequently asked to determine whether or not the 14th Amendment had in fact enfranchised individual natives. The committee reported in 1870 that natives were, who remained bound to their tribal nations were not and could not be subject to the Constitution's 14th Amendment, including its citizenship clause. Committee members focused on the phrase and subject to the jurisdiction thereof, correctly arguing that the answer could only be determined by examining the status of Native nations at the time the amendment had been adopted. This approach represented a model of legislative reasoning the likes of which we rarely see today in U.S. politics, because it was apparent that Congress did not have natives in mind when they had studied and ratified the amendment, right? The committee wrote that, quote, to maintain that the U.S. intended by a change of its fundamental law, which was not ratified by these tribes, and to which they, were not, they neither requested nor permitted to assent, to annul treaties then existing between the U.S. as one party and the Indian tribes as the other parties, respectively, would be to charge upon the U.S. repudiation of national obligations, repudiation doubly infamous from the fact that the parties whose claims were thus annulled are too weak to enforce their rights and were enjoying the voluntarily assumed guardianship and protection of this government. The committee members forcefully and accurately maintained that natives were outside the constitutional framework. For those of us working in today's political climate, their reasoning seems astonishing. They base this assertion on the necessity of securing formal consent, noting that consent was a fundamental requirement for passage of any law that affected native nations. The power of consent versus mere consultation, which is a bureaucratic process sometimes used to undermine native sovereignty quite often these days in the United States, is critical to keep in, to keep in mind. Think of how different things would have been at Standing Rock uh, in 2017, the fish wars in Washington, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, or so many other takings and invasions. If consent from Native nations had been required instead of pro forma consultation. But getting back to the 1870s worldview, the members of the Judiciary Committee declared that since formal consent had not been obtained, the 14th Amendment did not apply and therefore Native individuals had not become U.S. citizens by dint of their birth. While they did acknowledge that individual Indians who had merged in the mass of our people had officially become subject to federal jurisdiction, they stopped short of declaring even these detribalized Natives to be U.S. citizens. Over the course of the five decades that followed, federal lawmakers and jurists weighed in on the political status of Native nations and individual citizens offering contradictory and erroneous solutions to the question. For its part, Congress in 1871 abruptly froze the treaty relationship while specifically leaving in place existing ratified treaties. Adding to the confusion, in reality, Congress continued to negotiate treaties, but it called them something else, it called them agreements, right? In 1887, Congress adopted the General Allotment Act which declared that allottees were to become citizens upon receiving an allotment. Yet in 1906, it adopted the Burke Act, which effectively withheld federal citizenship from allotted Indians until the end of the 25-year trust period, 
Ornchill and Alati had received a fee patent to their lands from the Secretary of Interior by being declared competent. Even as Congress muddied the waters of native status, the federal courts issued a series of utterly conflicting opinions. The Supreme Court said in the 1884 ruling in Elk versus Wilkins, no relation to, to me, uh, declared that natives remain citizens of their own alien nations. Yet in the matter of Hef case in 1905, the High Court held that individual natives who had abandoned their nations or had received allotments were entitled to immediate unfettered citizenship. They didn't know what to do with us, basically, folks, right? Three World War I era federal court cases, all involving Alatis, preceded the 1924 ICA. Together, they were the culmination of the false ideology of wardship invented in 1831 by Chief Justice John Marshall in the Cherokee Nation case that you're mostly familiar with. They are important to this discussion because they established a bizarre line of legal reasoning that fundamentally dilutes the force of the 1924 ICA. The course deemed native individuals as perpetual incompetence, even after acquisition of US citizenship. Two of these cases are Supreme Court opinions neither of which has ever been overruled by any subsequent case. The Allotment Act of 1887 has provided that the land, not the individual owner, was subject to the restriction that had been imposed by the Burke Act, which had said that an allottee, while theoretically a citizen, could not in fact attain complete citizenship until the termination of the trust period, 25 years or less, depending on the Secretary of Interior. This restrictive clause defined native citizenship as clearly inferior to that of whites. The courts, lacking clear directions from Congress, were tasked with resolving the questions of their inherent legal incompetency with respect to property. I won't go into the details of the cases, but want to share just a couple of juicy quotes from all three of them, because they matter, right? Because they're still the law. In 1915, in U.S. versus Diebel, an appellate court held that the restriction of the allotment deed was prima facie evidence of the legal incompetency of clown woman, a Rosebud Sioux member. The court explained it this way. The chief purpose of and main object of the restriction upon alienation is not to prevent the incompetent Indian from selling his land for a price too low, but to prevent him from selling it at all. To the end that he shall be prevented from losing, giving away, or squandering his proceeds and thus be left dependent upon the government or upon charity for his support. That's pretty powerful right there. Citizenship then did not include cultural differences or propensity to squander resources. Natives were deemed innately inadequate to make economic decisions in the U.S. capitalistic society. A year later, the Supreme Court re-entered the field in 1916 in a very important case, U.S. versus Nice, although there was nothing nice about the case, if you were an allotted Indian, uh, it issued a powerful ruling that enshrined into law that allotted natives were indeed U.S. citizens, but remained subjects to virtually unreviewable plenary power as dependent individuals. And you'll hear more about plenary power when, uh, when Keith Rashad gives his talk. Justice Van de Vanter said that, quote, citizenship is incompatible with tribal existence or continued guardianship and so may be conferred without completely emancipating the Indian or placing them beyond the reach of congressional regulations adopted for their protection. NICE has been cited in over 120 cases since 1916, most recently in the important child welfare case, U.S. versus Holland versus Brakeen, a very good case for child welfare, which you'll probably hear something from Celine about that, but it has never been overturned. Finally, the third case in 1917, in U.S. versus Waller, the Supreme Court doubled down on its conclusions about native political status manifested in Nice, that native incompetency and American citizenship could and would continue to coexist. Justice Van de Vanter, who wrote the opinion in the Nice case, also wrote the opinion here, and here's what he said. The tribal Indians are wards of the government, and as such under guardianship, it rests with Congress to determine the time and extent of emancipation. Conferring citizenship is not inconsistent with the continuation of such guardianship. For it has been held that even after the Indians have been made citizens, 
the relation of guarding and war for some purposes may continue. On the other hand, Congress may relieve the Indians from such guardianship and control in whole or in part, and may, if it sees fit, clothe them with full rights and responsibilities concerning their property or give to them a partial emancipation if it thinks that course better for their protection. Again, total control still, right? Notwithstanding our citizenship. The court's inconsistencies thus ensure congressional inconsistency. Full citizenship rights under the Constitution would be distributed to natives at the whim of Congress, partially, wholly, or in fluctuating portions. Those same rights could also be withdrawn at any time by federal lawmakers. It took a world war to alter this endless cycle. Natives from many nations, whether allotted or not, or partial citizens or not, volunteered for World War I in larger, larger numbers per capita than any other ethnic group. After the war's conclusion, Congress in 1919, noting this extraordinary level of volunteer service, offered citizenship to those who had served and were honorably discharged. Under this law, the native person had to request citizenship, thereby consenting, right? Show proof of their service and give proper identification before court. This newly minted U.S. citizen also retained his or her rights as a tribal citizen. In the wake of this law, finally having grown weary of the permutation and combination of the citizenship, Congress enacted the 1924 law, which has brought us all to beautiful Bordeaux. Um, which problematically extended U.S. citizenship to all remaining natives without regard to qualifications or previous legal status. I say problematically because the status was thrust upon individual natives without their formal consent, a requirement clearly outlined in the 1870 Judiciary Committee report in the four, about the 14th Amendment. Based on this, it could be reasonably argued that bestowing citizenship through the ICA without express native consent is an unconstitutional law. Judith Sklar has observed that the first mark of citizenship is, she says, the equality of political rights. If that's true, then U.S. citizenship for natives as announced in the ICA has proven to be largely ineffectual because the notion of indigenous legal incompetence as articulated by the federal courts remained good law and effectively nullified efforts by Congress to provide natives with real constitutional protections. If, if U.S. citizenship does not enter any, into any consideration of the role of Congress in Indian affairs or restrict the powers of Congress with respect to indigenous peoples and their lands and rights, the only apparent benefit to Natives would be the power to vote huh, in federal and state elections. Of course, as Jean Schrodel pointed out in her 2020 book, Voting in Any Country, while the ICA resolved the question of citizenship, it did not explicitly identify what rights and privileges were associated with citizenship. And since states reserved the power to set the eligibility criteria for voting, many natives who wanted to vote were regularly denied the voting right in certain states. And as states developed a range of legal strategies to ensure that native citizenship not entail the right to vote until as late as 1950. Utah was the last state to formally allow it, right? At this very moment in the United States, there are numerous court cases that have been filed by indig indigenous citizens and their nations living within Western states whose voting power in state and federal elections has been overtly denied, dramatically curtailed, or hindered in ways that affect access. In practical terms then, the ICA qualifies natives to exercise rights under the Constitution's 15th Amendment but does not provide us with due process and equal, protect, equal protection rights under the 14th Amendment. That's what mine laid out in, in our book, Tribes, Treaties, and Constitutional Tribulations. As one federal court put it in Groundhog versus Keeler in 1971, the 14th Amendment's due process clause is not embraced by the Indian Civil Rights Act of 1968, and importantly, there is also no effective limitation on the power of Congress to enact legislation with respect to Native nations. In short, there remains a critical need for real clarification regarding not only the constitutionality of the ICA, but also the political and legal status of Native individuals who have citizen rights in three distinct polities, their nation, the state, and the federal government. Ultimately, formal consent, lacking in so many critical questions and conflicts, should once again be required for any significant decision regarding the rights of indigenous peoples 
their lands and their relatives. In closing, until such balance is restored, indigenous peoples living within the United States and the insular territories remain vulnerable to frequently hostile entities, particularly corporate officials, state officers, certain federal lawmakers, and agency administrators who still seek to profit from our treble citizenship status, a status that leaves us vulnerable to congressional plenary power and shifting definitions of federalism. Thank you very much. <laughs>